okay to everybody? Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Tina, would you like to go ahead and begin? Sure. This regular or this special meeting is in as now being recorded in accordance with the open meeting law. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joan Vorderbruggen. I am the chair of the Minneapolis Arts Commission. Before we begin, I'd like to note that this meeting includes the remote participation of members as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. I will now call this meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll so we may verify the presence of a quorum. Commissioner Aylesworth. Commissioner Bedberry. Present. Commissioner Brinkman. Present. Commissioner Silky Jones. Commissioner Mansfield. Present. Commissioner Mabius. Present. Commissioner Smith. Present. Commissioner Swinton. Present. Commissioner Thompson. Present. And Commissioner Borderbrogan. Present. Thank you. With that, we will proceed. Uh, a copy of tonight's event was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at lims.minneapolismn.gov. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a, with great uh, excitement that I welcome you all this evening to our artist panel discussion. Um, I am welcoming you all in, alongside my colleagues on the Minneapolis Art Commission, and we want to give a special thanks to the Access and Engagement Action Learning Team within the Commission who led the coordination of tonight's event. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to turn their cameras and their mics off, and, and we may do that for you uh, unless it's appropriate and there's a time to speak. We're really um, excited to hear from our artists today and most excited to introduce um, our facilitator, Trisha Hearing, who is a Minneapolis-based curator, consultant, and an arts organizer. In 2012, she co-founded Public Functionary, a Northeast Minneapolis-based platform that supports underrepresented artists in building a community of practice. As an independent arts consultant, she currently balances a full plate of exciting and diverse projects. For example, embedding an artist cohort in the design process for three St. Paul Public Library renovations, directing a new mentorship program for BIPOC students at MCAD, curating the corporate art collection of RBC Wealth Management, and leading the installation of 10 new murals along the Central Avenue corridor. For the past 10 years, she's advocated for an equitable and inclusive MSP art sector by finding the seat at unlikely tables of influence and opening them up to new processes and ideas. Trisha was born in Bangkok, Thailand, raised in Cairo, Egypt, and currently lives in Northeast Minneapolis. With that, I would love to, to welcome Trisha. And I, I want to just also mention that the Minneapolis Arts Commission would love for people to become more involved. We do have some vacancies. If you are interested, there will be a link in the chat if you want to find out more about that. With that, welcome, Trisha, and thanks, everybody. Thank you, Joan. Um, hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here tonight. I feel like it's been a while since we had, you know, artist panels and discussions. I know a lot of them have been happening online, but it still feels like they're not as robust and frequent as they were in our pre-pandemic life. So um, it's really exciting to, to feel this energy coming back and, and discussion starting again. Um, I am just gonna go through a quick intro of each of the artists and uh, speak their names into the space so that we can um, welcome them. And then we will uh, start the conversation today. So let's just go through, we're gonna show a sample of work. We have Atsin Reyes Fernandez, And I'll just wait for you to switch. Uh, thank you. Christopher Harrison. Marlena Miles. Witsi Asoko. And Kali Tao. And I know that Mary will be putting their full bios in the chat for you. Um, we can also include information, links to their websites and things where you can follow up with the artists. Um, but I will invite them all to turn on their cameras and for the um, screen share to end so we can start the conversation.
I don't see any artists yet. <laughs> We see you all. OK, let me just see if maybe I change my screen share or maybe my uh, screen format and I can see it better. Oh, there, that's better. OK. Um, all right, so the goal tonight is to share experiences. I know that all of you have collaborated with the city. You've had commissions. Um, you are working, practicing artists, and you all have this breadth of experience um, creating art, engaging with communities, um, creating art, particularly in public spaces. And so I think it's really interesting to go beyond just a survey um, and really follow up in conversation around what those experiences have meant. I know that the Arts Commission is interested in how the city can grow and how they can work better with artists. Um, and so hopefully we can uncover some of those gems tonight. I'm really excited to be in conversation with all of you. Um, so considering that you have all collaborated with the city, I think we can just start with that as the, as the starting place um, and really kind of review what it is that worked well for you in collaborating with the city and what aspects were challenging. And I think just to start, I want you to reflect on your experience with the city and share with us um, what were some moments of the collaborations or the commissions that you worked on where you felt joy, where you felt like you were in a creative flow? Like what were those moments of creating the work that you were commissioned to create that were super fulfilling for you? Um, and we'll start there. And I'm just gonna call on um, Kali to start us off. Uh, for me, uh, I've worked with many different um, cities, but working with the city of Minneapolis, I felt that uh, like the the deadlines were realistic versus like other uh, cities that I've worked with. And also the fact that we were uh, like meeting almost like where deadline deliverables were. So we were able to kind of share our project with like our other artists, the staff. So it kind of felt like everybody was moving their project forward, but also that the city was like a part of our project. We appreciated you appreciated the structure and deadlines and then also kind of having that support along the way. Um, what about you, Marlena? What did you appreciate about the process? I appreciated working like with other artists who are also on the same project and being able to ask questions and get feedback from, you know, from their experiences. So I think artists that have more experience kind of naturally pass that on to artists who might have just gotten their first city commission or something. And I just enjoyed that sort of fluid um, conversations that happen between artists that I wasn't expecting. So that would be sort of just the opportunity to collaborate with other artists. And I think um, in this recent project, um, the Public Works Building, uh, all of you were working sort of alongside each other in the process. So I think that's a little bit unique um, to be able to work in, in a larger cohort of artists. But I think that's a great takeaway to think about um, how often artists will be working um, individually on commissions versus in, in a sort of cohort model. Um, Atsin, what about you? What was what was joyful or positive about working with the city? Um, so I uh, was <laughs> the project that I did with the city was pre pandemic. And <laughs> so it was um, I found it really helpful to have like an informative session um, before like anything was due for consideration. And so to know like exactly what was being looked for um, so I could kind of like hone in on that and then um, afterward, then uh, kind of what um, others were saying, like to be getting together with the artists who are also like contributing to utility reps for um, for me, and uh, to yeah, to like get to see other people's stuff and like um, yeah, and get to actually interact with other artists too. And what about you, Wit? What have you loved about working with the city? <laughs> Just what Marlena and Adzin had had to say. I haven't. I only got the opportunity to work with Kelly and Marlena, but in such huge admiration of these two and the others involved in the in the project, there was just so many talented people, and to bounce ideas off of one another and actually feel a community was like 
a really special thing. I know that wasn't like a direct byproduct. I mean, it wasn't a direct a directive of of the commission, but we made it happen, and we we really I think really love each other and like to this day exchange text and like know that we can count on one another if we needed some real talk and that's great aside from that uh, the staff like the openness for me for the four on well the 311 staff and also the public works people they gave me such incredible tours i think they were really hungry to share what they've been you know working through in their daily lives and it was just so great to take tours of many different places that i wouldn't have access to unless i knew a, a city staff member so yeah those were really great things what do you in terms of the actual artwork um that you all created what is it that you're proud of with that work or what did that work what did that particular work contribute to your overall practice or your overall body of work like what what did you learn personally from that piece and um anyone who's ready to go can jump in i learned a lot of technical things i mean that's a pretty big print and the print services uh, people that helped that were subcontracting. Marlena and Kali, I'm not sure what the, the name of the place was. I forgot. I was racking my brain for that. But uh, they were extremely helpful. And I guess I, I responded to the fact that it was vinyl and I really wanted to make something tactile, like painting wise. So to translate that and thank you, Kali and Ash. Um, they're two artists that, that scanned it for me. and. Yeah, it, it was great um, to have something tactile blown up so big and prominent in, in the new building. I can go next. Um, the company that Wit was thinking of is Vermilla, so just so that. Um, but for me, I my what like my pieces are about like what's important to native people like what is wealth to us so i was able to actually meet with the community do different a few different events and gather people's feedback and for me that was something new for me because usually i do research and from scholarly sort of sources so it was kind of good to hear people's life stories of growing up in minneapolis and then taking those stories and their ideas or their wishes for the future and including that in my pieces too. So that's something I really enjoy with my pieces. I feel like they reflect what people hope, what Native people hope for um, living in Minneapolis. I can go. <laughs> um, I, uh, so my piece that I did was um, a pretty like, hard left from what I had done before, um, just because I had worked in um, like more traditional media, um, just like foiler acrylics, um, things like that. And so to do something that was like completely digitally based was uh, something that I hadn't done before. And, um, and, and also even just the content that like a lot of my stuff was historically like body based a lot of portraits um things like that and um so to do something that was not that at all <laughs> um was it was a yeah it was a lot of fun to put together and um to have that kind of like in the context of like what was um what the utility reps were kind of like looked for it to be to have like certain details or like components um was yeah it was fun to get to um do that Okay, for me, uh, it was really exciting to have like community engagement and my pieces speaks about like um, immigration coming to America. So when I held my community engagement, uh, a lot of them shared like their stories about how they came to America and like the importance of folk tales and, you know, nature and animal and how that influences you know, our way of life. So I definitely wanted to put that into the final piece, but also the fact that I had creative freedom. I think for me, I struggled because of you were able to kind of have that creative freedom. So um, for me, it was, you know, that was challenging, but otherwise, you know, everything was pretty fun. 
Yeah, I think it's always important to reflect on just, you know, what you what you were able to create, because the opportunity to make art is such a privilege and the opportunity to be paid to make art um, is even better. <laughs> so I'm curious if you can speak to some of the challenges and you can approach this in terms of challenges that you found personally, just in terms of working um, with the city, you know, because of the medium you were working in or the context or the time or if there were particular challenges with the process or, or the expectations that were set out of you. So just set out for you. So just thinking about um, challenges. And I, I think it's an interesting thing to even frame because I think there are always challenges with every, every art-based project. Um, so yeah, I'm curious what was, what was a, a difficult part. Uh, let's start with Marlena. Sure, the difficult part for me is always when you're selected as a finalist and you're presenting to the panelists and you get 15 minutes um, to really try to talk about your piece. And um, I feel like that's not enough time for some of these big projects. And then to like the panelists, you don't know how they will respond to your presentation. So you're very nervous. I remember my first um, like attempt to get a commission you know like one of the panelists had like a personal issue with someone I was applying with and they got into like an argument during the Q&A section and so it was like I felt like it was a big disaster at that time I'm like I'm never applying for these again uh, that was like embarrassing and awkward and but the second time and the third time you know it's it was a lot better so but I still find it really hard to be able to really talk about like things that mean a lot, but also have it explained so the panelists understand it. Um, because it's hard as artists, I think, to speak, because normally we create visuals, you know, so it's kind of hard to talk through the process or talk through the project and have people understand it through words. So I find that for me is always the hardest part is the actual presentation. Just actually even you know, putting a proposal out there, putting your work out there and getting the, the collaboration or commission to begin with. Um, what about you, Wit? Overall, it was a, a great experience. I mean, there's always the frustration in working with the city and getting paid and going through the bureaucracy. And that's that's a huge learning curve, but I've done it before and you just gotta expect to get paid a, a lot later than what you think. But um, the biggest part for me, and it wasn't frustrating, it was just more in the back of my mind, is that, you know, it was great that they hired a architect or a artist to like identify spaces in the building. But I would, I would have, and it's a great opportunity for us. But I think like a bigger commitment on the city's part to actually embed it into the architecture versus like an ornamental um, situation. You know, much of the, a lot of these are vinyl, and when you think about like the WPA era in comparison to what we're doing in our public spaces. It's like, I love the commitment and the pay and it's great and not to like denigrate the experience, but it's just like knowing that the bar is like the WPA era and like actual craftsmanship and like working with artists hand in hand and in incorporating it into the building and to see like that the identified spaces were glass and like temporary, somewhat temporary things. So. I would just push the arts commission and the, you know, the staff to do a little bit more and like work a little bit deeper with the artist. It was a great opportunity. It's just that was always in in my mind as to in comparison to some of my heroes in working with municipalities. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, before you leave it at that, actually, would you would you just say that so the the sort of vinyl application feels to you like a bit of a temporary application and it would perhaps be more meaningful to have works that are more permanent, like embedded into the walls, painted, you know, just sort of like, like you're saying the works progress era where it was like things were carved in or, or murals were painted permanently that now can't be destroyed. Are you thinking about the legacy that artists are able to leave or the narratives and stories that they're able to put into these public spaces and city buildings so that they're not removable or erased. I that I, I think that's spot on. Um, I love the commitment. I mean, the city's doing what they can. And obviously, like an artist like Marlena practices in the digital realm and it is a total valid form, but like how do we have more permanence? You know, like is there is it glass etch? So it's actually materiality is actually permanent, you know, or is it are they like CNC routed? 
metals. You know, I know the city has done this before, so it's not beyond them to do that. But like the the disappointing fact is that we hired an artist um, from outside of the state to identify these places in the building. And it really was dictated by the architects, right? It's like the space is the thing. The space is the art. I'm like, I don't want to ever set up a like uh, us versus them, but it always seems like architects and artists, you know, and architects win in this situation. And it's it's very much more complex than that, obviously. But like it it, it just in this case, it was like second fiddle to to the architecture. And I, I it, it's horrible to to uh, like have an experience like this and get paid. But I I really want this to happen. And I know the city can do it. And I've worked with the city in many, many aspects. And we can just do a little bit more, you know, what is more permanent and what is long standing and what is like a spectacle or something that is isn't normally presented. Um, I, th I think Christopher, like the sculptors might have a different perspective because they actually created something very physical. Right. Whereas the um, the windows were were like vinyl. So I'll, I'll quit taking up too much airspace. But yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Thanks, Whit. And, and I would, you know, encourage you not to apologize for having feedback or criticism um, just by, because you got paid. You know, because you got paid for your work doesn't mean that you shouldn't have an opinion about how that collaboration went. And that's what we're here for. You know, and I do, I want artists to speak up more about their experiences. Um, Atsim, can you share with us a bit about your um, challenges or difficulties with your commission? Sure. Um... Mine, yeah, is maybe very different in that mine was uh, really the biggest challenge that kind of comes to mind for me was a really technical one, um, just because, as I mentioned, I um, was, like, really new to working digitally. And um, so, like, after uh, I had my piece accepted, um, the following deadline to have to have the work um, basically formatted to like the right specifications so it could be like printed and like actually look good. <laughs> and um, so just on that specifically, like I had to, <laughs> I had to basically lean on my brother who is an animation designer who's like very familiar with that <laughs> um, and helped me out a lot. But um, that, yeah, that was something that like, I just <laughs> had a really hard time with just because I was really new to it and was kind of like figuring it out as I went. If you had to do it over again now, do you think that it would go differently? Uh, I'd like to think so. My brother's <laughs> still out there, so I might, I might just call him up again. <laughs> I'm, there might have yeah. been some muscle memory left over, but <laughs> support. So you know that's valid. Kali, what about you? Um, what was challenging for you in terms of working with the city on your commission? Uh, I'm a visual and public artist, so I create traditional work, but I know how to transfer that onto like glass or, you know, different surfaces. So the challenge was basically trying to figure out, do I want to create something digital using, a, you know, like a, th a software or do I want to do tr like hand painted? So I decided to do the hand painting and the beauty about it is that um, it's printed on vinyl, but it's like a dual side. So I definitely wanted to play around with like, um, like one side is color and then the other side is just like really white. Um, and that aspect was really, you know, challenging, but yet it was, it added a layer to like my artwork, something that I don't, that I wouldn't normally do if I did it traditionally. And I do want to say something about, I mean, I know Wit talked about it, but, um, I do also wish that artists were included early on when it comes to public art, uh, when they're building, you know, like everybody invests in, in architecture and basically they're like, okay, here's the build, but it'd be nice to like invite artists before they actually build the, 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 the site because, you know, we can have something that may change, um, you know, structurally something that we can add and that just that, because everything that we create, it's always like, okay, it's got to fit this spec, you know, this size. So we're like, okay, how can I think creatively? How can I fit this? You know, we can do it, but it's just, it would be nice to be like, oh, I would love to do something like this, but I need it, you know, the space to do it. So. Yeah, yeah, I know. I absolutely agree with that. I think that one of the misconceptions that 
we have to kind of break through with artists is that, especially public artists, um, is that they just create sort of the, the object at the end. The building is created and so now we do the call for artists and we, we put a sculpture or a mural into this designated spot. When artists are so tuned into the way we move through spaces, the way we feel in spaces, the way that spaces offer you know, different opportunities for art that you probably wouldn't think about. Um, and so I'm absolutely an advocate for working with artists early on. And it's something that I think um, could change, especially in, in the city, because there's, uh, you know, now artist cohorts and different ways that we can think about artists as advisors or, um, you know, just consultants. I want to circle back to something Marlena said about the panel process and about applying and kind of have the rest of you weigh in on on that. Um, one of the things where we're at now is that you already got this commission, you already did this work. But what can you speak to in terms of what it was like to actually apply um, for a commission and ways where you feel that there would be more access or the process could be different in terms of you know, just sharing your work for a commission. And if it's limitations with the city process, that's one thing, but just limitations in general that you find as public artists applying for RFQs or RFPs. Um, and I know Marlena, you spoke to, to that to get us started with this. So um, Kali, do you have anything to add? And Marlena, if you wanna add more to what you previously said, we can follow with that. Uh, for my experience, um, I think, just having because I have different uh, social networks that will send me like call for art. Um, so that's kind of nice to have, but not everybody has that, you know, not everybody has the opportunity where you build a relationship with people and different organizations where they will say, hey, you should really, you know, um, do this call for art. I wish there was a little bit more where you have a liaison that goes to like uh, different communities that would never really see these call for arts and maybe encourage them to do it. But yes, the process is very nerve wracking. I mean, I totally understand when Mar what Marlena is saying, because regardless of how many um, interviews and everything that I've done, I mean, it's nerve wracking regardless, so. Yeah, just to follow up, um, Marlena, with what you were saying, do you think that there could be a different way that these processes could be approached so that they're not so nerve wracking or so that they don't feel so intimidating? Um, maybe they could hire, I don't know, like a like a representative that works with people who have an idea and kind of presents it as a group with them to the city with maybe more of a time period or um, talking like the new artists through it. So it's not always the same people who know how to game the system or something, you know, that have access that way. The artwork better represents the community. Um, people will find it too intimidating to apply. They're like, I wish I could do that, but they don't have any confidence in themselves. And it is really hard, you know, um, so I can understand, um, I think. Yeah, I just think if there could be like a lawyer or representation, someone that represents a new artist, like a group of people and kind of does the presentation with them, you know, tells them what the panelist really wants to know. Um, because I've worked with like, people at Springboard who would read through the presentation and tell us, like the person I was working with, like this part needs to be explained more. Um, this part, they're going to ask you about this, like that was really helpful. So I think if there's just more like mentors like that, that people who are going to like apply, have someone that can really tell them what's missing in their presentation, and what people are going to want more explanations of. So. Mm -hmm. It's like in a city process, perhaps there's a there's a call or an RFQ, and then there's maybe coaching provided for the artists that are that are in the next round of applying or something. Um, I know Wit that you have applied for a lot of processes. You've also advised on artist calls and are are really embedded in in that world. I'm curious what your thoughts are on just the fact that artist calls have to be open so that they can reach as many people as possible and anyone can apply supposedly. So given that the, the impetus behind the, the structure for these calls are that they're open, do you actually think that they are accessible to people? Um, and is the process really working against that idea that an open call or an RFQ is open to anyone to apply? Uh, that's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like be on the side where they, you know, do call me. And I think we, 
we need to expand the network and it's our duty as people that have especially BIPOC you know people artists like we need to open you know open more pathways and that's been totally my life work I would say you know like at other museums and other places but like for me that's super important but when I man mentioned this idea to the panel like I was like we know that Springboard, MREC, um, Walker, Mia, you know, Forecast, City of St. Paul, City of Minneapolis, all identify this as an area of deficit, right? And like, I'm encouraging them to all come together, just like board repair, like June Lee did this beautiful thing. It's like identified that, like, there's a lot of boards that need people of color. And there's a lot of people of color that want to be involved in boards. Pretty simple idea, right? Like, she filled four stories of like organizations that needed people of color to be a part of their board. And she had just as many like people turn out to want to be a part of that. It's like an open call, but people got to see it as a, as a landscape and like really open up the doors. Like we're not just city of Minneapolis. We're like, there's a lot of public art opportunities and like, how do we present it to a large field that is willing to be involved and hear the process. So I'm just advocating for that more more marketing more like joint partnership to to reach um these types of artists that aren't hearing about these opportunities and of course i don't want competition but i know it's the right thing competition is good and yeah i'll just quit talking christopher hasn't said anything i'm just gonna say christopher <laughs> what's your ideas <laughs> sorry christopher i didn't think you were here you're here christopher yeah. <laughs> i'm so sorry yeah sorry. yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was a little tardy. I, I didn't get the link until late. Oh, there um, you are. Yeah. Hi there. I, hi. Yeah, yeah, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Christopher E. Harrison. Um, I'm a, a visual artist and uh, a public artist, he, him, pronouns. Um, and um, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have a, at least three public art projects through the city, um, sculpture, sculptural pro, uh, projects. And I also, for a time, was on the uh, uh, Minneapolis uh, Arts Commission for about three years, four, no, four years. So um, I kind of see both sides of the, uh, you know, application process. And um, from my perspective, I think, um, I think artists, especially, you know, artists of color or marginalized artists really need to know how the process works um and i i know um you know Whit had kind of said something about that and so did uh marlena um yeah it's it's really about knowledge you know you know how do i you know write my proposal correctly you know um what are the parts that you know need to be addressed um how to write a budget you know um yeah those things you know if you're just you know an artist who has an idea you know how do you, how do you do that? You know, how do you respond to those things that are in the RFQ? So if it's, you know, possible, if there's just like some classes or some, or, you know, some kind of, you know, set program where people can actually go and hear professionals talk about, you know, well, this is, you know, this is how I approached it. This is how, you know, I thought about working with, you know, uh, fabricators or contractors or how to talk to engineers or where to find the resources to get those things done. And how, and you know, how can I work that into the budget that they, you know, provided? Because I know over the years that that was the, the kind of things that I needed help with. Fortunately, I, you know, worked with some fabricators who knew how to do that. So that, so I kind of learned from them. But um, other than that, you know, if, if I'm just, you know, like, uh, you know, a graphic designer or, you know, a visual artist or, or and I have this three-dimensional idea or, or a, you know, a performance idea or something like that, you know, chances are you probably don't have a way to um, articulate that in a way that'll fit into the framework that the city puts in front of you. So I would say, you know, are, are there some ways, you know, other than like springboard or something like that, something that's really specific and very targeted on, you know, this is the way you write up, you know, uh, you know, prospectus of your work or of your idea. 
and uh, how to present. I think that would really help. Um, yeah, I think we'd have some good uh, ideas on, you know, getting marketing out there to those more marginalized, uh, you know, groups who, you know, maybe might be too afraid to, you know, apply for something. They might have an idea, but, you know, they just don't know how to go about it. Um, another thing that I would add is also uh, time of the RFQs, because pr from my experience, it seems like they don't give you enough time to put all this stuff together. You know, they say, oh, this will be due in two weeks or something. And it's like, really? I, you know, I just came up with the idea. And now I only have two weeks to get all my stuff together and write it up and have this idea that makes sense to put out there. So I think, you know, maybe more time for RFQs. I know that they're on a schedule and usually it depends on that schedule for all the other pieces that are in the puzzle. But, but you know, for something that's going to be as important and as, you know, visual as a, you know, an art piece, you really need to have it thought out and the artists and the ideas really need to have these things, you know, together to present, to have something that, you know, works, works for the space. Thanks, Chris. Also, again, apologies that I didn't see that you were here. Um, Teams is not my favorite platform. No. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that, that's fine. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm glad you joined the conversation and always love to hear your thoughts. Um, I would like to think a little bit further about um, just, you know, applying in the panel process. But I'm wondering, even if there was all of the support, like let's say that it was a different system and you had workshops or you had support in putting together your RFP, are the expectations of a commission or a collaboration with the city accessible to emerging artists? Um, and does the city actually have an obligation to make their public art commissions accessible to emerging artists? And that's kind of the question because you know these public art, there's expectations around them. And should they be more where you know we do design sort of concepts and then the city provides a fabricator? You know, is that something that you would want to see? Or is it that it should be that you are you know, further along in your career before you can access a city co uh, commission. I'm curious, just like your thoughts on kind of what we expect from the city of Minneapolis in terms of providing public art opportunities to particularly emerging artists. And I guess we'll say within that, a lot of under-resourced and marginalized artists who haven't always had the opportunities to produce at the scale that public art projects require. Um, and I'll let anyone jump in that has thoughts around this. Yeah, I, I would say start small. I mean, you know, because, you know, I, you know, when I was first starting, I wouldn't expect to do a hundred thousand dollar project, you yeah. know, because you don't have that knowledge or experience to, because you, you, you want to make sure that what you have is up to what the budget uh, demands, you know? So, um, you know, emerging artists, they, they, you know, they should start small and maybe, maybe the city would want to think about, you know, having specific, you know, smaller budget projects for, you know, emerging artists, you know, to take a, take a shot at. I mean, you know, I, I've seen plenty of projects that are, you know, $10,000, $5,000, $15,000, which really, you know, isn't a lot, but, you know, that's where you can have your concept, you know, fit you know, fit that space. And then you can kind of learn about how to, you know, construct your idea to, you know, fit that price point. So, and like I said, and then that's maybe that's the part where you get into more learning and more opportunities to, to, you know, figure things out or, or have mentors or whatever. So it won't be so overwhelming because, you know, oh, well, they want me to design, you know, a banister or create or or a park bench or something like that you know just small little things because then it's not a a huge huge risk and maybe maybe you can make some mistakes but you know it won't be so much of an investment right you know? other spots on the city's obligation to support emerging artists or if these projects should be considered for artists that have more experience well, what I've noticed with between Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minneapolis already has their planned contractors they want you to work with. They already had their fabricators picked out. 
um, they already have pretty much the whole process sorted out and you just are submitting art that's going to be printed on these vinyls. Whereas like the city of St. Paul, I'm working with them on a project and you know, I'm in charge of hiring different people to do different parts of this all entirely on me. I just have a budget to work with. So it's, I think if the city of Minneapolis is going to already have contractors that the artist is going to be working with, then maybe that should be more clear when people are applying, like what experience level that you're going to be necessary. Like, are you just supplying art that's going to be like engraved into the sidewalk and you don't, you're just supplying an art file that someone's going to do that or someone's going to print it and install it. So you really aren't looking into engineer or how, you know, this fits um, as like a safety issues. Like, if, like when you're building like a sculpture, um, like the artist there has to understand like the, how the public will be able to interact with it and whether it's safe enough and meets the city rules. And that's a lot, that's a lot harder project than having your art printed and installed in some format. So I think like emerging artists, they can make it clear like what level of art experience you might need to complete this project. So that's in like, I think what Whit was saying and what Kelly was saying that some places like the, where your art is going to be installed is already sorted out. You don't get a choice in it. So if they want more experienced artists, they should be able to apply when something is being built and have their art be more flexible and where it's going to be displayed in that building or in that park or something. So I do think the city could do a better, le like a better job of just explaining levels of um, experience you may need to apply for this. That way too, that some people don't get over their heads, you know, and apply for something that might be too big for them, ends up having a lot of issues with the budget or having a lot of issues with the schedules just because they're, they're kind of feeling trapped in this whole process too. So. I think it would help avoid that too. Yeah, I really, I like that idea of just like, if you're thinking um, of applying to this, this is the level of experience that you need, or this is what you can expect, um, a different way of framing that. I also was thinking about something Witt said earlier about um, collaboration across all of these different entities that put out uh, public art calls and that perhaps there could be more of a standard or there's like a sort of recommendation on how to make RFQs as equitable and inclusive and accessible as possible. And these are the ways that they are. I mean, I know as someone myself who puts out a lot of calls, I've started stripping it down to like really what is necessary. Do I need a resume? You know, like, do I really need to know all the projects that you've ever done and the budgets that are attached to them? You know, so um, I think that there's ways that the calls could probably be um, clearer uh, in terms of just like how to access them. Um, I want to switch gears just a little bit. Time goes by so fast and you know we're kind of coming to the last section of this, but um, as you know, there's gonna be a new city, um, a new department of arts and cultural affairs um, in the city, it's being created. And I know that there's a vision um, with this department to really think about how to grow the city's capacity to um, support public art and to support creative collaborations. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of other ways that artists could be involved um, and other ways that the city can work with artists. And this is something we spoke to a bit about just artists being embedded in building design projects. But beyond that, if you were just dreaming, um, what are ways that you would wanna work with the city that don't require you potentially even to like generate artwork? Um, and I wanna bring Adzine back into the conversation and, and see if they have anything to add in terms of how you'd like to work with the city beyond creating artworks. I, well, hey, go on first, but I'll go for it. Um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I find myself kind of thinking of the, um, what folks were saying in um, like bringing in more, um, I mean, underrepresented marginalized communities, like in general, um, into like consideration for arts and public work. Um, and so to, <laughs> and, and I was thinking even just like for the projects that I um, had worked on, I uh, found out from actually a friend who's on this call, hi David. <laughs> um, and other, yeah, but like if I hadn't like been sent that, I don't know how I like would have heard of it. And so like to have a form of more actively reaching out uh, to, seek out input instead of a, I don't 
like have the details worked out of how that could look, but the idea of being able to like actively like request and pull um, like people in and like bring folks in um, who are actively missing otherwise uh, is something that I would really love to see to kind of, yeah, to really like fill in there. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's just outreach in general in terms of build, bringing more communities in um, to working on public art projects. Um, Whit, what do you think? How are ways that this new department might open up possibilities or, or what are ways that artists should be working with the city? So many ideas. Uh, to be quick though, I know that um, Olgun and Mary both have done incredible projects and I've been a part of them. I think they just need to be ongoing and like uh, a lot of times I'm working with cities like the city of St. Paul, city of Minneapolis and their community engaged projects and when you ask somebody about the streetscape, they tell you about social services, they tell you about the parks, they talk to you about schools and they see the city as a big hole. But if we had these ongoing hubs for like uh, community engagement, like that people knew in their own communities that they can go there and interact creatively and also give feedback like ongoing, not just like, you know, I love the thing that happened at 38th in Chicago, um, not even 38th in Chicago, obviously the thing, the thing being George Floyd Square, but um, more so down the down the way that is, what was it, is uh, Chicago in, oh, Chicago and Lake, you know, Sam Arrows Phillips, Haircuts mm -hmm. Change, I know that was a creative city making project, and a lot of other artists work there as well, and I had one up here six blocks away from my house, Lowry and Central. You know, there are many of these hubs and they don't even have to be city lots. They can be at Pillsbury Aspen Theater. They can be at Juxta. They can be at, you know, tons of different places. So I just think that it's we do a good job of community engagement, but we need an on, ongoing places and have them, you know, be vibrant by by just rotating artists there would be a great use. Um, I think also we need to work across agencies, like a lot of the agencies work in silos, like the city does their thing, Hennepin County like does their thing, MPRB does their own thing, Met Council does their own thing, and they all work with us, like Kali, Marlena, Christopher, they, we're all, we all work with all of them, but it's like, why can't it just be all together? <laughs> you know, like, I yeah, I, I just want to advocate for that across agencies and working working with many different people. More connections, more more just artists like arts community building, I guess, would be really important. Um, Kali, do you have any thoughts on uh, what could be how artists might also work with the city and how this new department might facilitate some of that? Uh, yes, I think maybe holding like um, artist talks, uh, public artist talks with other like emerging artists or even just holding an event in like the communities that are um, underrepresented just because it's very intimidating to um, even apply for these, you know, call for art. And if we are able to give our experience, maybe that will encourage more people to apply because there are, it's a very different process when you're working with the city versus when you're creating something in the gallery or like, you know, just in even like murals. So it's a different process and knowing uh, those steps and the process I think would help, um, you know, other people kind of push them to uh, apply because honestly, everybody's got to start somewhere. So I think it's, we have to encourage people or artists to really apply regardless of what level they are because we all had to start somewhere, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that it's it's interesting. I was looking back at some of the things I wanted to address in, in this conversation and a lot have been touched on, you know, things that you're, you're saying to potential artists that want to collaborate with the city or, or get into public art. Um, just thinking about things that the city can do better, thinking about possibilities and where there were challenges. Um, I guess just in, in a way to wrap up and let everyone speak again, I'm curious what you want to share just as a public artist, as an artist, I mean, as an artist and a public artist working in this time in Minneapolis um, or in St. Paul in the metro area, um, what does it mean to you to be doing this work today? Um, what is something that you want to share with other artists who might be thinking about um, getting into this work? And you don't have to answer all these questions. This is just, these are just prompts. Like what, what comes to mind? What do you want to share? 
um, we don't always get a platform. And at this time, with this recorded conversation, you have a platform. So I'm just going to leave it up to you to kind of share some final thoughts or some knowledge or something that is on your mind or something that's inspiring you. Um, and let's start with Atsin. Um, I uh, kind of, I feel like I kind of want to echo what uh, some of the things that were said just in that, uh, I mean, especially what Kali just said, um, that like, I would encourage people who might think that they don't necessarily like have a good chance at like being chosen um, in a call or things like that, like to like shoot your shot and <laughs> like um, just to try and like go for it and apply it. Um, and there are people who are, if you can reach out to them, like who will support you in that process if you have like questions about like, um, yeah, what, what's needed, what's required, like how to do it right, um, then uh, yeah, you, you can maybe uh, <laughs> do better than you think and like have a better opportunity than you think because if you don't apply it all, then you don't get it. Yeah. yeah, just try. I mean, you have to put yourself out there. It's hard, but all of you have done it many, many times. <laughs> um, Christopher, what do you have on your mind? What would you like to share? Um, well, yeah, it, yeah, I know. I, I really don't want to be preaching to the choir, but, <laughs> but um, no, I, well, I would think about, um, you know, working on uh, location because I think visibility is one of the most important things in public art. And it, and, you know, from, from my observations, it seems like a lot of the public art is kind of in the same places, you know, it's like downtown or, or maybe there's some places, you know, over, you know, over south or 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 maybe northeast or or something like that but but maybe maybe there might be some opportunities and places that normally wouldn't have public art you know like you know maybe in you know riverside you know maybe there's more public art over there or or, or there there's some public art in north minneapolis in some spots but it's it's still kind of spotty you know um I know one thing that was cool um, last year, or maybe it was the year before, maybe it was last year, um, when uh, Jordan Weber did um, an art project. It was through the Walker, but it was right off of um, like Lindale and and uh, you know 34th or something like that. He did like a like a, a garden uh, uh, art piece that you know had a, a basketball court in it or something like that. And a lot. And, uh, nice amount of people came over there people who normally wouldn't come over to that neighborhood to see something so you know are there opportunities like that in other places that you know really don't get a lot of exposure to public art you know to you know to have you know the community come together you know and it doesn't have to be an actual thing it could be an event you know it could be some kind of you know interactive uh uh, you know, opportunity or something like that, you know, um, you know, it could be a read in, you know, people bring books in and, and, you know, read on and, you know, in the neighborhood, I don't know, you know, it could be, you know, something like that, but something yeah. that really brings, you know, communities together that normally wouldn't get exposure to public art. I mean, you know, yeah. how come there, you know, how come there isn't a, a, a mural, you know, festival, you know, uh, you know, far, far South Minneapolis, you know, yeah. um, you know, how come there isn't something like that, you know, other than me and, you know, an uptown or whatever, <laughs> you, know, you know, or something, you know, yeah, bring it to different parts of the, you know, city and, and re really get communities involved that normally wouldn't be exposed. That's probably one thing I would say would, would, you know, really be cool along with the other stuff about, you know, uh, you know, marginalized or emerging artists who don't, you know, get the opportunities because they just don't have the confidence to try to do it. But, you know, mm -hmm. providing ways for them to be educated, you know, I think would definitely build on them, you know, feeling like they have a chance to get something and adding diversity to that pool. I agree with all of those things, particularly more art in places that don't 
really get art um, and it doesn't have to be permanent, although it should be, you know, just not pop-ups in the places that don't get the permanent artworks. But I just think that there is a rule of there are, it will never be enough public art. You know, there's an infinite amount of space. Um, Wit, what would you like to close with? So much. I mean, first and foremost, I'm super proud of our city, not in all the things that we've just experienced, but that the fact that we support the arts. When I talk to people, you know, from other cities about what I do, they're just perplexed as to like how I make my life because there's so many crazy opportunities. I feel like if you dream up an idea, now that we're a part of a network, we just got to get the network a little bit bigger that if you have a crazy idea, you can get it to happen. If you know about the neighborhood groups, you know about the city, you know about all the avenues for funding, you can get it done. And I know that's the case, but I mean, for the most part, Minneapolis and the Twin Cities, it's quality of life is the arts, right? It's like, it's essential to who we are. And I feel like I contribute in my own ways and the city does this and supports it. It just needs to be more institutionalized in a way. Like, I want to see ongoing opportunities, not just fleeting moments, right? Like these things that are permanent infrastructures. Could we have a billboard that's on every, you know, in every neighborhood that gets rotated, that city owned property? Let's make a commitment to artists. And like, it doesn't have to be permanent. Like, of course, I'm going to fight for like a sculpture that's going to sit for decades and decades. But there's also like about the moment, like if we didn't show you like that artists can come out in these moments and really like be healing can be the voice of the streets like uh, i i can't i'm so proud of like the artist community that um, going through george floyd going through all of these you know all of these tragedies and like having artists step up in the way that they did on their own accord i mean you all funded it through creative city making and thank you um we just need to do more of that and it can't just be in, in response it's got to be the the institution and knowing that these opportunities exist every year and we're creating new infrastructures like physical infrastructure for artists to participate in is like what i want i mean just by christopher saying like vacant lots right there's 800 plus vacant lots in the city and we're talking about four projects you know we could have like so many you know like we just got to partner with the other organizations and like the other city entities to really make them realize that there's this opportunity and not this deficit. So I'll just quit yammering on and on. Um, I hope we can take a couple extra minutes because I do want to hear from Marlena and Kali. Um, Kali, do you want to just wrap up with a few thoughts that you have on your mind? Yes, if you want to get into public art, um, I would definitely encourage you to like reach out to the city because there is a process and it may be intimidating, but uh, once you learn that, um, it's really easy to kind of, uh, you know, go to another city and the experience may be a little bit different, but there's always a process. And I've learned early on, I, I have my to go structural engineer. Okay. I always have a structural engineer because a lot, when I started out, no one really, I never really thought about that. I didn't know you had to have a structural engineer and the budgets are not always there. So, um, try to find like teams and fabricators that you work with because then you're on, because sometimes the deadlines are so tight. If you're working with the same people, it's like they know your schedule. They, I know how long it's going to take them. So you start pumping out more um, public art on time deadlines. But yes, I wish it was um, bigger budgets and you know deadlines that um, architectures have because then I would have more time to dream of something different versus um, fit the size, fit this mold. But I just want to encourage artists that if they really want to get into public art, just, you know, take a chance and apply. Absolutely. Thank you. Marlena, you're last. Okay, well, save the best for last, right? And <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like, community artists, what we do, I think we're kind of like community liaisons, you know, we listen to what's important. We listen to people's stories, kind of like what they have as hopes and dreams for their communities. And when I was creating my mural, like I sat down in a coffee shop and I had people draw me stickers of like what their current life situation was, what their dreams were, like to be inclusive to Minneapolis. Like how, what, what do they want to see themselves? How does the city 
why is it important to them, you know, to live here, to be here? And like, why did they raise their kids here? Like, and I gathered a lot of data, you know, like I have it written down in sheets and sheets of paper. And it's like, I felt like I got a lot more information sitting down and having coffee and drawing with people than sending out like a link on a survey where you're just, there's no response to anything you're saying. Like, it's kind of like art therapy with some of the people that you know, they're telling me the hard lives they have, but they still have such hopes and like a good positive outtake in the future. So I think artists could be used as community liaisons or as like community therapist, even if they have that sort of therapy background, even not just a technical artist of fabricating something, but using artists ability to connect with people. I think the city could do a better job at that rather than like relying on the police to do stuff, you know, or hiring certain specialists to do things. I think, you know, I think artists do have a special ability to connect with the communities and me sitting like a native coffee shop, the people there, you know, they see someone that looks like them being able to do these big projects with the city. And I think just seeing that also will motivate people to apply for these kind of projects versus having even just a workshop or having coaches or something I think just having like an experienced artist go places where there's people in your community that they can relate to just sit down and talk with people you don't have to make it a super formal event so that way people feel pressured to come and be at a certain time but just show up at like I said I just showed up at the coffee shop and sat there for like three or four hours and whoever came in you know just had different kinds of conversations as with Judy Stickers so I think you know I think artists have that that ability and I hope the city kind of sees us as having I don't know, magic I guess so not just technical abilities of how to beautify the city but also how to respond and listen to the community absolutely um I just want to say thank you all for sharing your truth tonight um so much that um, I just you know it's like a lot to think about a panel with five artists and Truthfully, I could spend an hour with each one of you unpacking the wealth of knowledge and experience and um, generosity that you all sort of embody in your work and your practices. Um, and I hope that there's an opportunity to do that in the future, but I appreciate you all sharing time with each other um, and sharing this, this time with everybody else. Um, you are imperative to our arts community. And I know that you all are connected to networks of artists who are also making the Twin Cities what they are. So um, thank you for everything you do. Um, I wanna thank um, the Arts Commission for inviting me to facilitate this conversation and just let everyone know that, that there is going to be a, re a recording of this. It will be found on the City of Minneapolis um, YouTube channel on the 2022 Minneapolis Boards and Commissions playlist. So you can find it, it will be archived. Um, and with that, I will just thank everyone and sign back over to Joan or Tina. I don't know who's gonna close or if anyone's gonna close, but um, have a great night. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Um, really appreciate the time that went into this and, and being able to have some extra time to just hear from all of you. I know it, it matters very much to our commissioners that they um, understand what it's like to work with the city and, and think about how we can improve um, situations from our vantage point and from where we sit, but also, you know, just more importantly, alongside all of you. So thank you very much. I, I will move to our formal template for our meeting to say that with that, we've completed all items for this meeting. I will ask members and staff if there are any other matters to come before this meeting. Anybody have anything else? Okay, if not, and without objection, I declare this meeting adjourned. Our next general meeting of the Minneapolis Arts Commission will be April 20th. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>